Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're going to be doing another episode of Planet Zoo and this will be part 25 of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights. So we're really getting through these and we've got our first one for update 1.6 so there's some really cool mods that we've got in this one. So we're going to be starting with uh, by Bongo Hardwood, he did the next three mods but I'll make sure to go over everyone. We're going to be starting with the American White Ibis that we can see here. You can see some cute babies here as well. So this is the American White Ibis. So these guys are a species of Ibis and are found in from Virginia via the Gulf Coast of the US and found mostly through the tropical New World. So like Cuba and I think the lowest area of their range is like Ecuador or somewhere around the uh, western coast of South America. And they get their name white ibis because they have the white coloration that's kind of obvious and but they really have this really cool white plumage and they have this bright red orange down curved beak that you can see here oh, let's see if we get one standing over there let's see let's talk with this one this one looks cute so we can see they've got this really turned down beak and this blue uh orange kind of feet as well so it looks really cool and black tips of their wings and are usually only visible when they fly and males also have larger and longer bills than females, and their breeding range occurs from the Gulf of the Atlantic Coast and the coasts of Mexico and Central America. And outside the breeding period, they extend further inland in North America and in the coast of the Caribbean, and also includes the Caribbean. So they are also found along the north, uh, western South American coastline in Colombia and Venezuela, and populations in southern Venezuela breed with the new next species that we're going to be looking at, the Scarlet Ibis, and sometimes consider different species, even though that's not generally accepted. So these guys have a really, really cool diet. So they feed a lot of a small aquatic prey. They feed a lot on insects and small uh, fishes. Crayfish is also preferred in most of their range. And they can adjust their diet and preferences depending on like individual preferences, prey abundance, and habitat. And the main foraging behavior that they do is that they prop their beak into shallow water and feel to capture prey. And it does not see the prey, it just like sticks it into water and uses it to try and feel out prey and if it feels something it goes for it. So during the breeding season the American white ibis gathers into these huge colonies near water and these pairs are predominantly monogamous that means they pair and both parents will care for the young although males do tend to engage in extra pair copulation with other females to increase their reproductive uh, success so that means basically they're cheaters. <laughs> So, males have also been found to pirate food from unmated females and juveniles during the breeding season. So, that's probably an evolutionary trying to get as much food for their babies as possible, especially if the females haven't been mated. And luckily, these guys are considered least concerned, and they are affected by uh, an increase of uh, mercury or methylmercury, which is into the environment as waste, and that can affect their hormone levels that affects their mating and nesting behavior and that can lead to generally more lower reproductive rates which is not very good at all but luckily these guys are least concerned so they're doing quite well and then get pretty big too these animals can get to like uh, 872 to 1261 grams and for males uh, a little bit uh, a little bit bigger than the females with females being 592 to 81 to 80 861.1 grams so the average of a little under a little under a kilo so the biggest ones are nearly one and a half kilos so that's really cool so yeah wonderful animal i really like these guys and next we've got pretty much the same maker we've got bongo hardwood again we're going to be having a look at the scarlet ibis so not too different from these guys wonderful i just love the coloration look at them running around look at them go so very very similar as you can see and even interbreed with the american white ibis so these guys live much further south than uh the american white ibis these guys live in south american parts of the caribbean and they are distinguishable from these really beautiful uh, scarlet coloration they have that's quite bright and bright red that really gives them a distinct look and they're one of the two national birds of trinidad and tobango and their ganara i believe that's their name is named for the simple uh several like populations and stuff that are found along the coast of brazil 
So they are, like the other weighted, they're considered least concerned, so that means there's no really pressing uh, issues to their population. And they're very hardy, they're quite numerous, and they're very, very uh, prolific, so they're doing all right. And they are sometimes considered a subspecies, the American white ibis, as I mentioned, it's not uh, too different. So the adult plumage is pretty similar to that, the young plumage is not quite as bright, so they're usually a bit more greyish. Adults can get about 55 to 63 centimeters in length, with males being slightly larger than females, and typically weigh about 1.4 kilos, and they have a wingspan about 54 centimeters, and also very highly migratory and move in big flocks, similar to American white ibises. So these guys are found in Brazil, Colombia, Guyana, Venezuela, and uh, Antilles, Trinidad and Tobago, and they live on all these wetlands. And there's recently been uh, wet, uh, bird colonies they've seen as far south as Johnville on the islands of San Francisco de Sul, which I believe is quite south. And similar, they tend to live in monogamous pairs, a lot, a lot like the uh, American white flamingo, and uh, not flamingo, uh, ibis. So pretty similar, similar diet as well. Not not very different compared to these guys. And sadly, though, there's there's some several populations of these guys that it seem to be in decline, but they don't seem to have a pressing conservation issue in terms of the whole population. It's probably just uh, naturally populations kind of ebb and flow, and plus human activity as well. And in some places like uh, Brazil, they've been listed as an endangered species. But just as long as we keep a good eye and don't destroy too much more habitat, these guys will be fine. I just love these cool... I love the reddish look of it. It's a really wonderful, really wonderful animal. So, we're going to move on to the next one. Also done by uh, Bongo Hardwood, but it's not an ibis this time. It's a really cool animal. It's called uh, a Nue Nue, or Nene. I don't speak Hawaiian, <laughs> so I don't really know. But it's also known as the Hawaiian goose, and we'll have a look at this wonderful animal. So, the Hawaiian goose is also known as the Nene. is endemic to the Hawaiian Islands and is the official state bird of Hawaii. And it is exclusively found in the wild in the islands of Maui, Hawaii, uh, Kauai, and Moroakai, and Hawaii. So that's where they're all found. And it's really cool. So they're thought to have evolved from the Canadian goose, which arrived on the Hawaiian Islands about 500,000 years ago, so about half a billion years ago, and is a progenitor of the prehistoric giant Hawaiian goose, and then a Nui, which is another species of, I believe, extinct goose. Um, and some of them are larger, but this is just one of the species, and they get pretty big too. So the giant Hawaii goose was, was restricted to uh, the iron Hawaii and measures one2 meters in length and about 8.6 kilos and making it four times larger than the nene so that's the big prehistoric one that we're talking about and these guys i believe they don't get too much bigger so these guys are medium sized they're about 41 centimeters tall and spend most of the time in the ground they are capable of fly unlike a lot of far, uh, island birds they're still able to fly and can fly from certain areas that's probably gave them a competitive advantage Females uh, have a mass of about 1.5 to 2.5 kilograms, while males weigh between 1.6 and 3.5 kilograms, which is 11% larger than the females. And you can see they have this really cool distinctive pattern. They've got this black head, and there's all these patterns going down them, with, especially with the yellowish uh, there. They look really, really cool, along with the black feet and black face. I think they have a really cool distinct pattern. So these guys are found in Coastal dunes, uh, lava plains, uh, pastures, golf courses, grasslands and all that. A sea level as much as 24,000 feet. And some of them are migrate between lower breeding grounds and mountain foraging areas. As I mentioned, they can be found on a lot of these islands. So they usually breed between April to August, longer than any goose. And most eggs are laid between November and January. And they mate on land, unlike a lot of other waterfowl. And... Nests are built uh, by the female on a side of her choosing, which one to five eggs are laid, average on th as three, depending on the island. And hook uh, kawaii is often this four. And females incubate these eggs for 29 to 32 days, so about a month. And they are born precocial, which means they are able to pretty much reliably feed themselves and don't really rely on their parents too much uh, in terms of feeding. And these guys are big herbivores. They feed on leaves, seeds, fruits... And graze and browse on pretty much anything they can find. Very big herbivorous animals. So kind of like the 
big herbivores of the Hawaiian Islands, along with the extinct giant uh, Pleistocene Hawaiian goose, things like that. And they're pretty rare bird. They're the rarest goose. There's only about 2,500 alive uh, today. So the rarest goose in the world, endangered species. They were believed to be about 25,000 uh, Hawaiian geese living in Hawaii when James Cook, the man who discovered a lot of Pacific islands, including New Zealand and Australia, uh, was uh, discovered the place in 1778. And introduced predators such as the Asian mongooses, pigs and cats, reduced their population down to 30. Luckily, they breed well in captivity and have been reintroduced. And in 2004, there was estimated to be about 800 birds in the wild, as well as 1,000 in wild, wildfowl collections and zoos. And we'll have a look at the baby. Let's find a baby. There's a baby one. It's quite cute, which is why we're talking about them. So there's concern about inbreeding, but they managed to uh, get their numbers back up very well. And there were... Lots of reintroductions, and they can now be found in captivity in a lot of sites, including on the island. But luckily, they are pretty much back from the brink. They are, there's a few thousand. They're still quite rare, though. Two and a half thousand, that means every individual is still pretty important. But luckily, they aren't on the precipice of extinction like they were with just three birds. So it's a really nice conservation story, and there's a lot of work still going into these guys. Really wonderful bird. So next, we've got a one by the famous duo. we got Leaf and Nicholas Wildrider. We have got a reptile this time. We have got the red-footed tortoise. Let's have a look over here. A wonderful, wonderful little bunch. Look at this wonderful bunch. Can't go in much closer just because they're based on the Arbebras and Galapagos big tortoises. So these guys are a species of tortoise from northern and southern America. They're a medium-sized tortoise. They get about 30 centimeters uh, in length as adults, but can reach over 40. They have these dark-colored, loaf-colored carapaces with these lighter patches that you can see on each scoot that really give them their really cool, distinct color. And they also have a lighter patch, uh, dark limbs with brightly colored scales near their feet that give them their name. So that's where they get uh, red foot. And you can see these like often cherry heads and all that. There's lots of different species of these guys, including the yellow foot. So there's regional difference can be seen from different regions, and they're closely related to yellowfoot tort tortoises of the Amazon basin. They're quite commonly uh, kept as pets, and overcollection has called them vulnerable to extinction. So a lot of overcollection for the pet trade has really put them at risk. But luckily, that's why if you always want to get an uh, exotic pet, always make sure they're captive bred because they're healthier and they're not taken away from wild populations. Just do that PSA. So they naturally range from savanna to forest edges around the Amazon basin. They are pretty omnivorous and they eat a wide assortment of plants, mostly fruit when available, but they will also eat uh, foliage like grasses, flowers, fungi, carrion and invertebrates. And they do not brumate but may estivate in hot dry weather, that means they kind of, when it gets too hot they'll just kind of relax. So like other um, species of um, tortoises, they when they lay eggs, they lay up quite a few eggs, and they are open to predation by many predators. That includes uh, pretty much anything that eats eggs, birds, uh, small mammals. Pretty much anything that'll eat an egg will probably eat tortoise eggs. But adults are also at risk from humans and jaguars, because jaguars can easily bite through a tortoise shell. They have very strong jaws. And population densities... Uh, from, range from locally common to very scarce, especially in areas with people, because there are a lot of people collect them for the pet train, and, and for food as well, so that can put them at risk. But they are pretty, pretty cool animals. I really do like them. There's lots of variation within their... Because uh, in the pet train, there's a lot of different variation that you can see, with like different colors. Some are lighter, some are darker. It just depends on the variation. Let's have a look at another one walking. Look at them go wonderful tortoise so they are in that way they are pretty uh, okay they're good and good captive pets but try to always make sure that you get them from captive bred people because captive bred is always usually hardier they're used to in captivity get used to people usually when they're born from the wild they can be stressed and have parasites and things like that so always captive bred if you can that's like pretty much if you're just a casual keeper, unless you're like a high-level keeper, you should probably always go with captive bred. But yeah, in, in captivity, these guys aren't too hard to care for. They're pretty reliable breeders. 
And like other creatures, they can carry Salmonella, which can obviously affect people. So you, if you have them outside, or make sure you always wash your hands and just make sure to keep everything clean. It's not a huge issue. I own reptiles, and it's not a, that huge of an issue for me. Just try and keep everything clean, and you should be good. Really wonderful animals. So we're going to be moving on to the next one. This one is by good old Bubbly Wums and Leaf, based off the new animals from the Africa pack. We have got the Eastern Chipmunk, and I think these guys are pretty cute. Let's see if we can get one running around. There we are. That's a juvenile. No, wait, no, that's an adult. Really wonderful. <laughs> Tiny little guys. So these are the Eastern Chipmunk, which are a chipmunk found in Eastern North America, and it's the only living member of the chipmunk subgenus uh, Tamaris, which is sometimes recognized as its own genus. So these guys aren't particularly big. They can read about 30 centimeters long, so about a foot. And watch them dig. So that's because he's based on the meerkat. So they have this cool reddish brown fur with these five brown stripes, dark stripes going down with contrasting light stripes, and along with a tawny body. And they uh, seem pretty consistent, and there's not really any external differences between the sexes other than genitalia during periods of fertility. So males, their, um, their, de uh, their genitalia will often swell up, and that makes it more obvious, but other than that, it's quite hard to distinguish. But they are both seem to be albinos and melanistic individuals, since they're quite but it just depends regionally. So they live in deciduous forests and wooded areas and urban parks throughout the United States, eastern United States and southern Canada, and prefers locations with uh, rocky areas, brush and log piles, along with scrub for cover. So these guys are also mainly active during the day, and they eat fruits, seeds, green plants, mushrooms, uh, insects, worms, bird eggs, and can, like other uh, rodents, they can put them in their pouches that they carry in their cheeks. They have these pouches and they can carry food around. So they live a pretty solitary life and they defend their burrow, uh, ex except during the mating season, and then they will have pretty much peaceful uh, uh, co social interactions, but only during the courtship. And then the young will spend uh, with its mother about six to eight weeks. They'll spend with their mother. And then they usually produce litters of three to five young. And there's two breeding seasons are from February to April and from June to August. And they may also enter long periods of torpor, which is not hibernation. It's not quite as intense. Uh, and during the winter. And they are prey for lots of species, including hawks, owls, foxes, raccoons, snakes, weasels, coyotes, bobcats, lynx, domestic dogs, and domestic cats. And on average, they live about three or more years in the wild. Uh, but in captivity, they can live up to eight years. And one of the hosts for species of botfly. But yeah, still a really cool animal. I really love, like, we're getting animals like these. These are still common animals, but it's wonderful. A really cool uh, eastern chipmunk that we've got going on. Let's have a look. See if can... The juveniles are way too big, but look how small they are. This is probably the smallest animal to come out so far for Planet Zoo. Be that modded or unmodded, but I think it did a great job. Bubbly Wums obviously does a good job. This one's a juvenile, I think. So you can tell the size difference. The babies, usually because you can't change the baby size, usually the uh, babies can be quite a bit bigger. Okay, but enough about that. We're going to be moving on to another cool animal. We have got from, going from America to Australia. This was done by Narwhaler. We have got the Numbat. So a really cool animal, Numbat. So is an insect insectivorous mammal and is diurnal, feeds and pretty much exclusively on termites. And here's a little fact before we get in. They are the closest living relative of the thylacine, or the Tasmanian tiger. Which is a really cool fact about them, even though they don't look it. <laughs> so, these guys were found once widespread across southern Australia, but are now restricted to several small colonies in western Australia, and is considered a small uh, endangered species, and are protected by conservation. And they have been reintroduced, luckily, into French, uh, recently reintroduced into fence sanctuaries across New South Wales and South Australia, and a kind of an emblem for them. They're a really cool, wonderful animal. So these guys aren't pretty big. They get between 35 and 45 centimeters, so not huge animals. And they have these really cool stripes going down their back with a nice fine muzzle. And they usually get between 280 to 700 grams. So they are usually diurnal because of their specialized diet of eating just termites. And they have a most, most ecosystems they live in where there's enough termites, there's enough numbats to support them. 
And they have these really long tongues, long narrow tongues with sticky saliva they use to stick into uh, the uh, termite mounds to try and suck out any uh, and lick out any termites that are in there. So really cool animals. So the historical map, they used to live pretty much all over southern Australia, but due to people introducing feral cats and such, their populations went down and down and down until their populations are estimated now. There's need to be fewer than a thousand left in the wild. But luckily there are a bunch of different sanctuaries across southern Australia, like New Haven and in the Northern Territory, also Mallee Cliffs, Mount Gibson, uh, Uramaka Sanctuary, a lot of different sanctuaries that are large few thousand hectares, um, I think the largest one's about 12,000 hectares, that are fenced off so no cats and no foxes can get in, so that's a protective haven for these species, and it's really cool because there's a lot of them, so you can mix and match, so you're really helping the populations of these animals, which is awesome. And as I mentioned, the insectivorous, so they can eat up to 20,000 termites in a day, which is pretty cool, and they're the only marsupial fully active at day. And they have pretty a lot of uh, known predators, including carpet pythons, sand goannas, wishtail eagles, goshawks, and also preyed upon by invasive red foxes and feral cats. And they have a solid t uh, territory of about 1.5 square kilometers, or about 370 hectares, in early in life, and defend it from others of the same sex. And then males and females' territories do overlap, so they can meet each other and make babies. And they're pretty powerful claws for their size as well, so they're pretty cute. So. Let's go talk to about the babies. Let's have a look at the cute babies. Where, where is it? Here's the baby. Where's the baby? There's the baby. Cute baby. <laughs> so, numbats bred between February and March. So that's in late summer. And produce one litter per year. And it produces possible to produce a second litter if the first one's lost. Gestation lasts about 15 days and give birth to four young. And unusually amongst misupials, females have no pouch even though they have four teats that are protected by a pair of golden hairs and swelling that the, by the surrounding abdominals and thighs, abdomen and thighs during lactation. So they don't really have a pouch. So the young are about two centimeters long at birth, and then they crawl to the teats and remain attached until late July or early August, where they've grown to seven and a half uh, centimeters. And they are three centimeters long when they first develop fur, and the patterning of the adults appears at 5.5 centimeters. And the young are carried uh, left in the nest or carried around the mother's back when after weaning and become fully independent by November. And females are sexually mature by the following summer, but the males do not reach maturity for another year. So as I mentioned, they used to be very, very common across uh, Western and Southern Australia, but unfortunately due to invasive predators and also habitat loss, their numbers went down to fewer than a thousand. So luckily there have been a lot of zoos and a lot of sanctuaries, especially recently, that have been trying to really help uh, propagate the numbers of the numbat. And... They are really important species because they are so evolutionarily different from other things. Again, they're closely related to thylacine. That's the closest living relative. And yeah, just generally just a very important species to protect. And they're also very, very cute. And look at that. Wouldn't you agree? That's very, very cute. I think that's very, very cute. So we're going to be moving on to another one by Narwhala. We have got the Mandacore, or the I believe the subspecies that he used was the Bokharan Mandacore. My core. So we're gonna have a look at this wonderful male and look at these wonderful, wonderful horns. Really did a good job at these. So there are large species of goat that are found in Central Asia, um, Karakoram and the Himalayas, and are listed as near threatened by the IUCN. So they get pretty big. They stand about 65 to 115 centimeters tall at the shoulder, uh, 13, 132 to 186 centimeters long, and weigh between 32 and 110 kilograms. They're the highest maximum sh shoulder height of under every species of Capria, but are surpassed by length and weight by the Siberian Ibex. Their coat is like a grizzled light brown that you can see here, and you can have this long head, and they have these really, really cool uh, spiral horns that you can see. And males are sexually dimorphic with having this longer hair and these bigger horns, of course. And it's kind of like a mane. And these big horns can grow up to 160 centimeters long and up to 25 centimeters in females. So males get these really big ones. And they have a pungent smell, which surpasses that of domestic goats. <laughs> so Makora adapted to mountain ter mountainous terrains and found between 600 and 3,600 uh, meters or 2,000 to 11,000 feet in the uh, air on mountain ranges. And it typically inhabits scrub forests, 
uh, made up primarily of oaks, pines, and junipers. They're also diurnal and mainly active during early morning and late afternoon. And they graze during this uh, summer and spring. And they turn to browsing in the winter. And they even stand on the hind legs. And we'll have a look at the babies while we're talking about uh, gestation. So gestation for these guys takes about um, 135 to 170 days. And usually results two kits and really three kits. Kids, I mean. So they usually live in flocks, usually about numbering nine animals, consisting of adult females and their young. And adult males are largely solitary. And adult females' kids uh, comprise most of the mandicore population. But adult females make it up 32% and kids make 31%. And adult males are 19%, with sub-adults up making 12%. And yearlings make up 9% of the population. So, yeah. These guys are also, uh, there's quite a few predators. Uh, golden eagles will prey along young mancor. Uh, Eurasian lynx, snow leopards, Himalayan wolves, and brown bears, the main predators of mancor. And also they are quite famous for hunting. A lot of people like hunting them. I think it's pretty cool. And especially in British India. But um, they've also been introduced into like private ranges in Texas. So they're now free range wild populations in Texas. Uh, within these ranges but there's not enough to really establish like a wild population they're usually managed within these uh, places where people want to go hunt them so along with animals like Aodad, Ngali, Ibex and Axis they managed within these uh, reserves or uh, hunting reserves and the population's are estimated to be a little over 6,000 individuals a little under 6,000 individuals I mean uh, and that's why they're classified near threatened and there's a projected uh, total population decline and they rely on conservation efforts to keep them at these levels so there's a bunch of different reserves in place and there's regulations sadly are poorly enforced and there is poaching along with these uh habitat destruction that really affects these guys but hopefully these guys aren't too much at risk anymore and they're the national animal of pakistan which is pretty cool and i just think they have a really unique looking uh look to them especially with the females you can see they've got these really little horns really wonderful animals Wonderful, wonderful animals. So next up, by Dr. De Hyena and Genora Pizza, we've got the last hyena. So we've got the Ida Wolf, we've got the Spotted Hyena in the game. We also got the uh, Striped Hyena, we covered a few episodes ago. And now we've got the Brown Hyena. So we've got now all the hyenas. Really wonderful animal we got here. So the Brown Hyena, also called the Stound Wolf, is a species of hyena that's native to Namibia, Botswana, Western and Southern Zimbabwe, Southern Mozambique, South Africa, and they're considered the rarest species of hyena. The largest remaining population of the brown hyena populations is in the Kalahari Desert and coastal regions of Southwest Africa. The global population is estimated to be between 4,000 and 10,000 individuals and is considered near threatened, since they are uh, not really huge effects on their population, but they're still so low that puts it at risk of extinction. So these guys inhabit desert areas, semi-deserts, and open wood and savannas, and they can survive by scavenging in close to urban areas. So they are pretty adaptable. They also can favor rocky mountainous areas and provide shade that is not dependent on the as they provide shade and not really dependent on ready water sources for frequent drinking. So they prefer these rocky mountainous areas. Home ranges range from 233 to 466 kilometers or 90 to 180 square miles in size and although found in africa they've passed they used to live in the iberian peninsula and other parts of europe and fossils of these guys uh belonging to the upper Pli pliocene has been found in gondrana so in the pliocene so that would have been about more than 2000 years ago these guys would have lived in southern europe so these guys are also really really cool looking you can see they've got this stripe they get the name brown here because of their brown but they've got this really distinct look to them you can see they've got those stripes down their uh, legs and also you can see they've got a really distinctive face and kind of like a mane going on and they get pretty big too the body length ranges from 140 centimeters on average and range from 130 to 160 centimeters uh, shoulder height is about 70 to 80 centimeters with a tail that's 35 to th 25 to 35 centimeters and there's not really a big difference between the sexes unlike spotted hyenas the average weight for these guys is between 40 and uh, 40 and 43 kilograms for an average male, and a female weighs between 37 and 40. Brown hyenas also have very powerful jaws, and young animals have been known to break the legs of springboks 
within five minutes of birth. And also this ability generates with age with dental wear. And the skulls of the brown hyenas are larger than more northern striped hyenas and are more robust and indicating a less generalized adaption. So brown hyenas have a social hierarchy, uh, hierarchy that is comparable to wolves, but the mated pair and their offspring, and they live in clans that are considered as extended family of up to four to six individuals. Clans also defend their territories and all members cooperate in raising the cubs. So that's pretty cool. And they also maintain this hierarchy by fighting uh, aggressive displays and mock fights. And brown hyenas can uh, move up the ranks by killing a higher rank individual uh, with confrontation. And the alpha female is usually just the oldest female unless she's obviously killed or dies. And they do not really have a mating season. They uh, typically produce their full first litter when they're about two years old. And males and females usually do not mate with each other. Uh, rather females will mate with nomadic males. So usually the nomadic males will come in and mate while the males in the clan will kind of do their own thing until there's another clan comes along. And that's how they prevent inbreeding. And clan males apparently are okay with this. They don't mind. And females give birth in dens uh, with the remote sand dudes far from territories of hyenas, uh, spotted hyenas and lions. They have a gestation period of about three months and mothers uh, produce one litter every 20 months. Usually only the dominant female breeds, but if two litters are born in the same clan, the mothers will nurse each other's cubs, so they just share, though favouring their own. Litters can consist of one to five cubs, which can weigh up to one kilogram at birth. And unlike spotted hyenas, brown hyenas are brown with their, born with their eyes closed and open their eyes after eight days. Cubs are weaned about 12 weeks and leave their dens, dens about 18 months. Also, unlike spotted hyenas, all adult members of the clan will carry food back to the cubs and they are not, they're not fully weaned and do not leave the vicinity of the den until they reach 14 months of age. So yeah, pretty, pretty cool. And they reach full size at about the age of 30 months and have a lifespan of 12 to 15 years. So these guys are pretty, primarily scavengers and they basically just eat uh, what carcasses left over by other large carnivores like spotted hyenas and lions. But they supplement their diet with rodents, eggs, insects, fruit and fungi, which is pretty cool. And they're poor hunters. And so live prey only makes a small percentage of their diet. In the Southern Kalahari, they eat spring hare, springbok, lambs, uh, bat-eared foxes, and korahans, which consists only about 4% of their uh, overall diet. While the Namib Coast, Cape fur seals pups consist about 2%. They also have a very acceptable sense of smell and are aggressive scavengers and will actually fight for approaching and take kills from blackback jackals, leopards, and cheetahs. And they may charge at leopards with their, leopards with their jaws held wide and can chase... So they pretty much bully anything smaller than them. They won't mess with lions too much though. So brown hyenas are often the dominant marsupial carnivore present in the Kalahari Desert because of their, there's not many lions, wild dogs or spotted hyenas in the areas. And they overlap and brown hyenas may kill, may often be killed on rare occasions. Uh, by lions and spotted hyenas. So as I mentioned, they are endangered, uh, considered near threatened because there's only about 10,000 individuals, but there's not many, too many press and conservation issues except for occasional uh, rituals and traditional medicines and also not really sought out. And they're not in high demand for trophies, so there's really only um, issues with livestock and such. They tend to stay their own thing. They're not really too prosecuted, but obviously being near threatened, they should probably be in more numbers. Really wonderful animal, though. Who doesn't love the brown hyena? So, we got last, but most definitely not the least of the animals that we've got today. We have got the Beluga Whale by Leaf and Africa. I believe that's the brand. I really like this beluga. So, belugas live uh, in the Arctic and are often called sea canaries, or the white whale, or melon head. And they're very well adapted for life in the Arctic. You can see they all have this white color that you can see going on here with the low dorsal fin so it doesn't get caught on the ice. So really, really wonderful. <laughs> and they also have this really cool melon here that you can see that they use for echolocation. And they also have more flexible necks than any other cetacean, so they're able to move their head and navigate a little bit better through tight areas in the ice. And they get pretty big too, they get between the size of a dolphin and a true whale, with males getting up to 5.5 meters long and weighing up to 1,600 kilograms, so a little over one and a half tons. 
Then these whales have very stocky bodies that you can see here and a large percentage of their weight is blubber that helps insulate them especially in the cold arctic waters and they use their melon here for echolocation to detect prey and get around. So these guys are also gregarious, they form groups about 10 on average, even though in the summer they gather in groups of hundreds or thou even thousands in estuaries and shallow coastal areas. And are generally pretty slow swimmers, but they can dive up to 700 meters deep below the surface and are opportunistic feeders. So they pretty much eat whatever they can, depending on the location and the season, they just pretty much eat whatever. They usually eat things like uh, fish and just really whatever. The majority of belugas live in the Arctic Ocean and the seas and coasts across North America, Russia and Greenland. And the world population is believed to be about 200,000 and there are populations that are migratory and move, uh, spend the winter in the Arctic ice caps and then when the sea, sea ice melts in the summer they move into coastal areas and estuaries. But some populations do not do that and just do not migrate year round, just depend on the population. So the native peoples of North America, Russia, and places like that have often hunted belugas for many centuries and they're mainly hunted by non-natives during the 19th and part of the 20th century and hunting belugas is not controlled by the international whaling permission but each country has their own rules to obviously make the harvest of belugas sustainable so they don't go extinct and usually a later asia alaskan native groups like the inuit and some people are allowed to hunt them aboriginally because there's pretty much no other food so they're allowed to eat that We'll ignore you while you're out of the water. Let me have a look at the baby as well. The baby, here's a little thing, the babies usually are a lot more grayish color. They're born gray and they become white as they grow up, so make sure that's a tad bit. So there's a lot of issues to these guys. These guys are often hunted by killer whales and polar bears. And contaminations of rivers by uh, a bunch of different chemicals like PCBs. Climate change and infectious diseases have kind of put these guys as some populations of these guys at risk though generally they are least concerned so they are doing okay-ish now for now though climate change is definitely a big risk for these guys and i just think they're so cool so cool so cool so they pretty much just yeah we'll pretty much eat anything salmon sea uh clams oysters pretty much yeah arctic cod flounder herring just very generalist so that's why they do okay and yeah, some populations are considered critically endangered, but overall the species is doing fine. And these guys are also pretty common in aquariums, they seem to do okay. Even though keeping cetaceans in captivity is generally pretty controversial. They seem to be doing alright in the places that they are. But yeah, a wonderful animal and hopefully we get to have them around for a lot more times to come. Just because of climate change, and we all know how bad climate change is. So yeah. I think this is a good place to end the video today, so I really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to click that little bell icon to get notified when I upload anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoy this video, if you guys like and subscribe, and bye bye